Well, okay. I want to welcome you. We're going to change the camera scene here just a little bit. So we've been sitting here quietly because we couldn't quite figure out how to put just a, a piece up there that said we'll start streaming in five minutes. So, David, when this goes before we post it, you might need to edit out ten minutes of the first part before we start. Anyway, um, there's a few of us uh, gathered, and I know that uh, John, who's suffered a broken leg, and some of you will be interested and want to know that. Keep that in prayer. John, if you're listening, your prayers are with you. And wish we could visit you. Um, but we're going to spend uh, now, um, we've really finished the material, the Life in Christ course itself, kind of that basic introduction, not just a, a Christian teaching, but through a Lutheran lens, what's our our foundation of Lutheran theology, and then who we are as Grace Lutheran Church and School. So we really kind of talk through and work through all of that. Thanks for all of you having uh, patience and perseverance through uh, through many weeks, and we're glad that you're here. We actually have a question here for you. Yeah. Uh, Erica Barris says, is this the beginning on a new session? No, this is really an addendum. So Erica, thanks for asking, and it's nice that you're tuned in. Um, no, and when I do Life in Christ, I do about 12 sessions that really give an introduction to Christianity and then Lutheran, kind of Lutheran framework and doctrine, and then who we are specifically as Grace Lutheran Church and School. But it makes sense to me that if you, uh, that as a Lutheran church, what does that mean? Where did we get that? Do we worship Martin Luther, or is he some kind of major saint for us, or... Um, do we have to do everything he says, and what does it mean to be Lutheran, and what's that history of that? So this is just a couple of sessions that I do to give some background and context, and then we use uh, the Luther movie, and I sent out links for that, and if you want the links to the movie, um, it they have it actually free on YouTube. If you type in Luther movie part one, you can get that. I sent it if you're in my if you're in the class. I sent those out, and we sent them. Carol sent them out by um, email today. The links to those movies. So, so this really just kind of says what is it? What's the history and what were the causes of the Reformation? And so why is it significant? Some people have argued that in Western civilization, a couple of different authors have argued that the Lutheran Reformation was. Uh, uh, after after the life and ministry of Christ, from that point on, the next most important event that took place in the history of the church. Um, I, that's certainly debatable. Uh, we think it's obviously of great importance. And then why? So let's pray. We'll start with a prayer, and then we'll jump into it, and, uh, and I'll give you some context. So anyway, thanks, Erica, for that question. I hope that answered the question. If it didn't, go ahead and ask another Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we give you thanks for your resurrection and the Easter joy that we now live in. Even though many are still uh, staying at home and suffering from some of the effects of disease and quarantine, and in different parts of the country it certainly looks different than it does here. So we hold all of those in prayer and those that are ministering and serving, to other, serving others. We pray for a swift resolution to this uh, pandemic and its impact and effects uh, economically and physically. But we thank you, Lord, for having conquered our greatest diseases, overcoming our greatest fears. We pray, Lord, that we might live in the light of that new life that you give us um, in, the, in the victory of Jesus Christ. And so, in this Easter season, we of course say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Now, maybe if you were lucky enough, or whatever, if you, I guess that's lucky, uh, we sent out the emails today with links to the movies, but also an attachment that had some material that looked something like this in this book. So, this is uh, material that I wrote for our confirmation students. So, those students that are in middle school and high school, along with their parents, when we talk about the history of the Reformation. So, it's about five or six pages of material. And I, what I think helps is, if you just go watch the Luther movie, it's fascinating, and if you're a student of history, you may know some of that context already. Um, but to have this discussion, I think, can really enrich your experience of the movie. So if you're in class, what I'm going to encourage you to consider doing, 
is watch that half of the movie after we talk today. And maybe you've already watched it. That's great. But after we talk tonight, then sometime over the next week, watch that first half. Then next Monday, we'll gather again, and we'll talk, and then I'll preview and talk a little bit more about the second half and have, have a chance for you to feel, ask questions. So if you ask questions during the week, I might just answer them um, online or in the live stream as we're doing, as we have it now. But if you have that material, it's called Session 17 and 18, History of the Church, the Reformation. This is really just to give some background on what's the Lutheran Reformation. So, <clears throat> to give you a little bit of history, you've all seen photos, pictures, and images here in this Holy Week and Easter season in Rome um, of the empty uh, St. Peter's Square and uh, the Pope doing uh, his announcements to kind of an empty group having to resort, just like the rest of us, to uh, technology and live streaming. And that actual location, St. Peter's uh, Basilica and the paintings of the Sistine Chapel and um, Michelangelo, all of that is in this time period. That's all happening here. In fact, a huge cause of, of something that caused people such great heartache in this era of the church was the funding of how that great uh, basilica, the largest church, one of the largest, the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, largest church, Christian church, but St. Peter's, the Western church, likes to think it's the most magnificent and, and, and largest. That's a, a big part of the cost, how they raised the money for that. Uh, they did it through indulgences, and we'll talk about that. That's a major thing. But, the, uh, but it's interesting because in our news broadcasts, You've seen probably many, many images of that empty St. Peter's Square. Some of it is because the pandemic hit Italy so, so badly. But, you know, we do, I, I, I don't think we've seen any pictures of uh, Constantinople, you know, of the Eastern, the headquarters of the Eastern Church. So people in the West often forget that the church was one for a thousand years. And so for a thousand years, uh, for a whole millennium, Eastern and Western churches were together, and they each had their kind of archbishops, patriarchs, and uh, Bishop of Rome, and Bishop of Alexandria, and so forth, and it was one. And then there was a great schism, is what it's called, uh, arguably, arguably the greatest heartache in the history of, of all, all Christendom. And because of that schism... Those of us that grew up in the Western culture, Western civilization, so that would be Europe and North America, even South America, where the Roman Catholic Church had its influence, um, you see no pictures of the Eastern Church. It's very odd. It's very interesting. I'm grateful for the friendship that Father Constantine and, and I have built here in this town. Beautiful, magnificent uh, uh, paintings and artwork that he has really championed. And uh, you should take an advantage to see that. But I think it's uh, critical to know that this Reformation <clears throat> impacted the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church. And that's much of the culture that we are steeped in. But the Greek Orthodox Church is just as significant. Um, and really, it's, a, it's kind of mother and father church of, the, of all of Christianity. And so... This history of the Reformation impacts fundamentally the Western Church. Um, and how did it come about? In a very, very simplistic way, too simplistic, and it leads to uh, poor thinking on this, is people go, well, the Catholic Church was just so corrupt, and it needed to be fixed, and Luther fixed it. Well, that's a, a gross oversimplification of it. And it somehow seems to imply that, that uh, somehow... Um, all Catholics were bad, or all popes were bad, or in this era maybe even, or all bishops were corrupt, and everyone selling indulgences was just kind of a charlatan and a shyster and a salesman. And, um, and that is never true. In fact, even in, in the region in which we live, and the, and the very strong presence of, the, uh, of our LDS neighbors, a, a major contention that they have is that um, the vision given to Joseph Smith was that all churches were corrupt. None of them were right. And it somehow leads to the impression that 
well, we now have a corner on the truth. We now know something new, something that people didn't know or had lost. And that really seems to imply that God is not in charge of his church and that God somehow abandons his church and that somehow we as sinful human beings can, can corrupt God's church, his word, his grace so horribly that it's lost completely. Well, that would make for a very poor God indeed. God has always faithfully retained his church, <clears throat> maintained his church, and retained his leadership, his authority, and his word and presence uh, within the church throughout all ages. A great example is in Kings, 1 Kings, when Elijah defeats all the prophets of Baal, and then he's on the run because Queen Jezebel is out to get him. And he runs and runs for his life, and when he gets to a cave, and he gets under a tree, and he's hungry, and he eats, and then he's hiding, and he's terrified. And God finally appears to him, and he says, you know, essentially, what's up, Elijah? And he goes, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord, and I've done all these things, and now I'm the only one left. And essentially, God kind of God kind of gives him a wake-up call, and essentially, like, how dare you? Um, as if I don't have control of my church, there are still, you know, uh, thousands that have not bent the knee to Baal. They are faithful. You just don't know it. And so to imagine that you alone may have a corner on the truth. So Luther was one of those who never imagined that he had a corner on the truth. Luther's great desire was never for a revolution. Never. He never wanted to break away from the church. He hated that, uh, that the followers uh, of, the, of the Reformation were called Lutherans. Be, and it really was, a, was an insult. It was kind of a swear word almost. And Luther, Luther's name for the movement that he, that he kind of instigated was uh, Evangelicals. Uh, they, it was the Evangelical Christian Church. And so that word has been preempted kind of in the last century also. And now it implies so many other things, some of them negative, some of them positive, but evangelical meaning for the gospel, for the gospel. So, <clears throat> so if you look in your material and want to follow along, and even if you don't, what, we've, what we're looking at tonight is what's kind of the historical context and what were the causes of the Reformation. So, you know, all the way back, you know, century before was uh, Jan Hus uh, from Bohemia, Czechoslovakia, um, um, Wycliffe, John Wycliffe in England, he also had been a, a reformer. Savonarola um, within, the, within the Catholic Church, all of these saw things that were going awry in, a, in a different degrees. And so <clears throat> it always has troubled the church that when certain men get into power, that power seems to be very... Um, pernicious, very easy to tempt and corrupt and draw us away from being humble and gracious and submitting to the will of God. And that certainly did impact. I mean, for example, there was a time when there were three different popes, all had different groups, factions supporting them, all claiming to be the Bishop of Rome, the leader of the Western Church. And and it certainly, it was just un. It was just unseemly. It was, it was obviously wrong. And many voices um, spoke to that over the centuries. Um, so why was it then that Luther, um, and at the time when he prompted a revo this uh, Reformation, why did it take? What were the causes? What coalesced? It's almost like some people will say, for, for anything great to happen, you kind of need a kind of almost a perfect storm of events. I'll give you an example. Here at Grace, for 40 years, Grace had dreamed, and in school board meetings it would come up almost every year, can we do a high school? And there just needed to be, it just didn't happen and didn't happen, and then there came a moment that God opened up with a donor and education in the state and support of alternate forms of education and some granting, and then some leadership, and all of that came together for us to be able to have a successful high school, and we'll have our first graduation this year, in spite of the pandemic, and 
We're going to delay it a little bit so that we can celebrate and cheer for these seniors, all 12 of them, and it'll be our first graduating class. So that's what needs to happen. Luther said himself, he said, you know, this was not a new idea that he had. <clears throat> it really wasn't that he was trying to start a revolution or do something new. What he was trying to do was go back to something old. He was a, many people don't realize this, Luther was a professor of Old Testament history, of, of the Old Testament theology, forgive me. And so, for instance, had the Psalms memorized. He was a brilliant Old Testament theologian. Um, it was Philip Melanchthon who was really the author of many of the New Testament uh, documents, the Augsburg Confession and, and uh, different documents that became critical for us. So Luther had this great love for the old, for the, the, the first covenant, seeing in it the promises of God and how they were fulfilled in Christ. So Luther himself said, in regards to Jan Hus, who was burned at the stake in Bohemia, it's a fascinating story if you want to Google, Google it and look it up. Um, but Luther said, we are all Hussites. Um, he, he himself said, Jan Hus broke the ground on this. He's the one who cited many of the issues that made it important and critical for us, uh, for, us uh, for what we champion today. So what were a number of the things? If you have your book, we're at the bottom of page 95, and it really is a question of what were the issues happening in the church? And the church had grown um, magnificently. Um, for the first three centuries of Christianity, Christianity was an illegal religion, followers of the way. And then Constantine becomes emperor. His mother, uh, Helen, becomes this champion of Christianity. Uh, in fact, goes all around the Holy Land, citing different sites as places of, you know, the birth, and this is where Jesus was born, and this is where Mary, you know, foot washing, and all of these different things. And uh, the crucifixion site, and the burial, you know, the resurrection too. Um, and so Constantine becomes... Uh, uh, very kindly towards towards Christianity, and ultimately not only makes it legal, but it ultimately becomes the official religion of the state. That leads to what we know in Luther's day as called the uh, Holy Roman Empire. And it's mostly it's in Europe, and so it's a collection of of those of these burgeoning nations, right? Spain, France, England. Henry VIII is at this time in England. Um, Charles is the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, very devout Catholic, and he's trying desperately to keep all of these nations and electors and dukes and everyone, kings and princes, on the same page. They're all Catholic, but it's a big tent and a lot's going on, and a lot of these states want a certain amount of freedom and independence <clears throat> from an overarching control. So there's always this battle between the state and then the church. Who's in charge? Is the pope in charge or is the emperor in charge? Um, who's in charge locally? Is it the local duke or prince or the king of the country? So there's all of these tensions going. And so the church often seeks to exert tremendous pressure. And so it would do things, and so in the end of in the in the interest of retaining power, and if we put the best construction on this, the Catholic Church was trying to retain control in order that the gifts of God, the sacraments, it's seven sacraments, and that those gifts could be faithfully and peacefully and correctly brought to the people. A largely illiterate population, but um, you know, they're all Catholic. And Catholic means uh, universal church. The Roman Catholic means that's the Roman location of the universal church. Remembering, of course, that there's a whole other half of Christianity, the Eastern Church, which also believes that it's the Catholic universal church as well. So, here's what's happening. So, because there's so much power centered in the Pope in Rome... And that was really the debate. Um, the, the Roman bishop continued to assert more and more aggressively that they were the primary bishop. When the church was early on, in those hundreds of years after Constantine, 
um, all of those different bishops from other significant locations, you know, whether it's Carthage or it's Rome or it's Constantinople or Alexandria, they were, uh, they were all equal to each other. And then the Roman uh, bishop essentially started to assert, well, I'm first among equals. And more and more there was a consolidation and a desire to put uh, power and authority in the Pope. Well, that led to abuses of power, sometimes financially, um, the acquisition of land, the acquisition of money, the acquisition of uh, buildings, um, and then it became military power. Certain popes, the pope before Leo, who's the one at the time of the Reformation, Julian, Julian was a, a warrior. I mean, what he wanted to do most of all was win battles, and he loved to wear armor and parade around and in uh, regalia and so forth. So you would see these, and then not only that, there were certain moral failings um, because there was so much power and so much deference and so much obsequiousness towards the position of the Pope. Um, they found that they, if they were of weak moral character, they, they had all kinds of illegitimate children and, and affairs. Some of it, sadly, became more and more uh, open open defiance. Um, and so people um, heard this, especially leaders in the church in different orders, Augustinians and Franciscans and um, different, um, different orders of monks. And they troubled people, but the Pope was in charge and he was the Holy Father. And then as things went along, as you can see, so there's a corrupting of the papacy, they would buy and sell bishops, for example. Uh, you could become a bishop of one location, but then maybe if you had enough money, you could buy another position that would give you more power. And that just seemed wrong and was wrong, of course. Also, these nations were starting to want to uh, feel their oats. Germany wanted to be for Germans. They didn't want to keep sending their money and stuff to, to Italy, to Rome. And the French wanted to be that, and the English wanted to be... Spain, Spanish wanted to be, and so, you know, you had the Poles, and all of these different people wanted, the, there were more nations, and so there were tensions there. They, they started to pull back from Rome. Um, one of the key things that happened in this era, too, uh, less than a hundred years before uh, Luther, is the invention of the printing press. And so when Jan Hus was, I mean, it's almost the comparison is, to ha is like the invention of the internet um, or the telephone with Alexander Graham Bell. The ability to leap forward in communicating effectively and accurately to mass numbers of people that you couldn't communicate with before. That's what the printing press was. So that you could mass produce pamphlets and documents and books and dissertations and Luther was prolific. Whether it was a three-page document or whether it was a whole book. Sometimes he could be very bawdy, and sometimes crude, and sometimes even downright mean, and he even confesses that at times, where he has been actually unkind and uncouth. Um, he's something of a reflection of his era, um, in which the dissertations and debates were often brilliant, but dirty. <laughs> and mean-spirited um, by our standards today. Um, so, anyway, the printing press is a massive, massive um, advance to being able to share the ideas of the Reformation. Um, and, then, and then there was questioning of what was happening in the church itself. So the Inquisition, where you just, where you tried to hunt Jews down, and you were suspicious, and if you were trying to find heretics, it's kind of like today, conspiracy theories. And certain eras, even in our own country, um, love conspiracy theories. And, uh, or McCarthyism, those, of, those people that are old enough to remember, or if you remember American history, where they were looking for commies, you know, in the 1950s. You know, behind every rock and tree and every Hollywood director was a communist, you know. And they were being accused falsely and so forth. And so people were troubled by that. Um, and then they had this rising use of indulgences. And this is a term you'll hear a lot. 
And the idea of an indulgence is this. The Catholic Church, so here's, here's one of the deals. The Catholic Church also has three primary sources of authority. The first one, obviously, and appropriately, is God's Word, is Scripture. Now, interestingly, in the Catholic Church, they include a section of books called the Apocrypha as, uh, as of equal authority to the rest of the canon of Scripture. So, the Maccabees is just as authoritative in the Catholic Church as, say, uh, Exodus or the Gospel of Luke. We don't think that because the Apocrypha is kind of obscure and hidden. It's kind of strange. It's not clear. So we take the clear, the books that have always been agreed to by the church on, in both Eastern and Western churches, those books, and that is our canon of Scripture. Um, so the Catholic Church had the Scriptures, but then secondly, they had what was called canon law, and in canon law, that's an outgrowth of of um, gatherings like the Council of Nicaea or the Council of Constantinople or Chalcedon, when they would have councils out of that would come things that became canon law or church law. And those were just as equal in authority to Scripture. And then they had a third source of authority that was equal to Scripture, and that was papal decrees. So if the Pope spoke what's called ex cathedra, right from the seat of authority, then his word was as valid and equal and authoritative as the word of God. Well, Luther had terrible time with this because as a student, as a professor and a, and a brilliant scholar, he would read these decrees of popes and councils and find that they uh, disagreed with one another. And then they would cancel out the one and then institute a new one. And God's word never changed that way. So Luther became a huge advocate for God's word uh, alone as our source of authority. And how blessed and grateful we are that that word has been faithfully and consistently transmitted. We never have lost the, the clarity of God's word because we retained in the original languages, uh, the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic texts, we have faithful copies of those. So we know that even in dark times in the church, even when there were times of great human and moral failing, God was faithful and his people were faithful, just like in the time of Elijah. And so they had those three sources of authority, and that got them into all kinds of hot water because they, were, they disagreed. And one of those was on indulgences. Nothing in Scripture talks about that you can somehow buy or pay for with money uh, or your own good works or actions uh, a good work for someone else. You can't save someone else. Your donation or your pilgrimage or your kind deed cannot um, save your children or save your grandparent. Or, and certainly for people who have passed and gone on, Scripture is clear. There is death and then the judgment. There's no... There's no you know, baptism for the dead. Even, the, you know, Paul talks about it as kind of a, a backhanded um, affirmation of the resurrection. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, and the LDS Church cites this passage, and they don't understand, seem to understand the context, because Paul cites it as a way of saying, this is why we know the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true. Because even this, these weird people who baptize the dead believe in the resurrection. They're wrong, but even they believe in the resurrection. And so we know that Christ is risen from the dead. So there were all kinds of um, strange teachings, and indulgences was one of them, that you could pay to get Uncle Henry out of hell or out of purgatory. Purgatory was another doctrine. came out of the Apocrypha in which the Catholic Church said, well, it doesn't make sense that anybody can go straight to heaven. Nobody's that good. And that's, and that's such a goofy tea. So therefore, you have to go through a time of purging, right? That's how we get the word purgatory. You have to cleanse. You have to purge all those sins out so that you can then have entrance into heaven. Um, well, we know that Paul, you know, that Paul and even Christ himself says, what, what, is the, what are the good works that are required of us to believe in the one that God sent? You pass from death to life. Um, there's no from death to purgatory to life or limbo or any of those uh, strange teachings. 
And they had other uh, interesting, odd kind of teachings that again are not in scripture. And what they end up doing is distracting us from, and actually, in some ways, it's, uh, you can at least see how it could be this way, take away from the full soul sufficiency of Christ and his grace to redeem sinners to himself. And so if you're saying, well, you got to pray to Mary, or you got to pray to saints, or you have to believe that Mary herself never sinned, or that Mary was assumed into heaven, or whatever, you know, where does it end? It's Christ alone who saves. It's Christ's perfection alone that becomes our perfection. So Luther kept running into this in Scripture and saying, how is it that, that the Pope could say this, or a council could say this, and then they would retract it, so how do they do it? The other thing is, so you can't buy and sell the grace of God. It's a gift, always a gift. The other thing in the Catholic Church, and this was not always the case, priests and nuns could not marry. It was said that their bride was the, or their groom was the church, married to the church. Um, but that's not how it always was, and nothing in Scripture tells us to do that. Um, and in fact, we know that it leads to less than um, optimal relationships and and lifestyles and so forth. And then in, in Luther's time, there was this whole thing of worshiping relics. And they worshiped these things that they said, oh, this is the skull of John the Baptist, or here's a tooth from the do Balaam's donkey, or here's straw from the manger of, of, the, of the birth of Christ, or a nail from the cross. Um, you know, Luther comments in the movie uh, one time, he says, there's enough nails in Saxony to, uh, from the cross of Christ to shoe every horse in Germany. Um, and so it became a scam, and it troubled people. And then people wanted to know, how are we saved? And that became to get to the, to the heart of the issue. And on top of all this, culturally speaking, in the whole culture, is the rise now, which is just starting, of the Enlightenment. So, of reason, and of humanism, and the idea that God has in fact endowed humanity with a brilliant mind, and the ability to discern God's processes and the way that things work in science and math and so forth. And so it began to be, you couldn't anymore simply say, well, the Pope said it, so you just have to buy it. I mean, a lot of people did, but there were others who's, who were troubled by simply saying that and not being able to question or to wonder or to see if there was another way. So the question became, is reason and faith at odds, or do they complement one another and work together? Now if you turn the page, we'll see. So those are all of the things that are happening at that time, and they all coalesce together in this little, unknown, German monk of a minor order, the Augustinian order, in a corner, in a, a little corner of the Holy Roman Empire, you know, many people kind of considered the Germans barbarians. And, uh, and this little monk starts saying, I don't understand it. It's not computing. It doesn't match with scripture. And so what he does is he poses a debate. This is really what the 95 Theses are. When Luther posts the 95 Theses on the chapel door in Wittenberg, which was where they posted all kinds of things for discussions, symposiums, and debates. Luther was essentially saying, is there anyone willing to discuss this with me? Because these things uh, are troubling to me. If you look in your book on page uh, 98 in the sidebar, here's just three of the 95 theses. Luther said this, the first one, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ will that the whole life of believers should be repentance. That in our repentance, we are confessing our sins, which God, who is faithful and just, loves to forgive those sins and grant us his righteousness. So he's wondering, why isn't that enough? Or Thesis 43, Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better work than buying indulgences. Or Thesis 84, and this one I think is so important. Why doesn't the Pope simply empty purgatory for the sake of most holy charity 
and of the supreme necessity of souls. If the Pope has that power within him, why does he not just open the gates of purgatory and release those souls to go to heaven? So Luther was posing 95 questions to, to try to have a discussion or a debate, and what he ended up doing was taking a big stick and poking the bear uh, really hard. So that's kind of the, the, the cultural and historical and theological um, background for what happens. Now, in your book, here are some places. Where does this all take place? The first is, of course, Germany. It's part of the Holy Roman Empire, and it's ruled by Charles V of France. Charles was a very young man. He was not a bad man. He was pretty good, and his father and grandfather, Maximilian, were brilliant emperors, very, um, uh, very wise and effective rulers. But this family is exceedingly devout, very Catholic. They're very Catholic. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is so huge, it's governed then by what we might call governors, but they're called electors. And some of them are dukes and princes and so forth. And that they elected an emperor uh, to govern them all. Also in Germany, so one of the electors is one of Luther's protectors, Prince Frederick. Um, and then Wittenberg is a small town, not a big deal, but it had a new university. Uh, Prince Frederick of Saxony founded a university and uh, Luther became kind of a star uh, professor, brilliant man, and, um, and, he, um, and it was where Luther taught, Old Testament. And then Worms, which is a weird name for a town, like, you know, the city of Worms. I don't know, I'd change the name if it was me, but in German I guess it's okay. But uh, that's where Luther defended himself when he began questioning. And then Augsburg, also in Germany, where Lutheran prince, princes then took their stand in confessing uh, their Lutheran theology. The other significant place in this is Rome. And so Rome is the seat of the papacy, and then people made pilgrimages to Rome. The Sistine Chapel, the Cathedral of St. Peter, the St. Peter Basilica was there. So those are the two places, really, that this is all taking place in. And then here are the primary people. A little bit of background on Luther. Luther's father was a miner, and he was successful. This is an era in which it, is, it sees the development of a middle class. This is the first time where we really see uh, this middle group of people who aren't born into a royal family um, and aren't peasants or serfs, but they actually, through hard work, industry, and cleverness and skill, they are able to carve out a business, a niche, and they become middle class, lawyers and doctors and you know, business owners. And Luther's father was a miner, and he did not want Luther to spend his years in the mines. So he sent him off to law school. And so Luther uh, honed his, his logic in law school, but the, as legend goes and as the story goes, he is traveling uh, on a road in the middle of a lightning and thunderstorm, and he is so terrified and part of his terror is what's well known about Luther. He is terrified of dying and going to hell. So this is an era in which you are absolutely told you have no shot, you have no shot of if you die to go straight to heaven. Like Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh-uh. Everybody goes to purgatory. And purgatory ain't no fun. But at least there's the hope after a few eons, or however long you need to based on their sinful life, that you could then finally make it on to, to heaven because of your baptism and because of some of your good works, or somebody went to bat for you. Um, all of which is just violently opposed to the clear teaching of Scripture. So Luther's a scared man, and so he's in this lightning and thunderstorm, and he doesn't want to die because he thinks he's going to go straight to hell. So he says, you know, God, if you keep me safe, if, you, if I live through this lightning and thunderstorm, I'll become a monk. And so, of course, he does, and he, and he does. And so that doesn't sit well with his father, but he uh, is a brilliant student, gets his doctorate, becomes a professor of Old Testament, and he's in, in uh, Wittenberg. Then, October 31st in 1517, 
That's when we celebrate the Reformation, Halloween, All Hallows' Eve. It's the day before All Saints' Day, All Hallows, All Saints, All Holy. And so um, Luther posts his 95 theses for debate and discussion on the chapel door. Um, four years later, he's uh, defending his position before uh, his accusers of the Catholic Church under protection. Um, he, uh, that's the very, very famous scene where he essentially says, Luther says, when he's asked, will you recant, will you retract all these things, uh, Luther essentially says, unless I can be convinced by you know, simple reason and the word of God, uh, I will not retract what I've said because my conscience is bound by the word of God, not by popes or councils, but my conscience is bound by the word of God. So that's where he says, here I stand, God help me, you know, and so he, and then he kind of walks out, and the people are just overwhelmed with support for him because he stood up to Rome, stood up to the Pope, and then he is, uh, he's kind of hidden, protected by the Frederick, by Prince Frederick, and while he's hiding and hidden away, he begins and largely completes one of the great pieces of literature in German uh, cultural history. Even today, uh, Germany considers Luther's translation of the New Testament into German one of the great works in all of German literature. It is an astounding work, and it infuriated Rome. At that point, the only versions of the scriptures were Latin. And very few, even almost no churches even had a copy. None of the priests, they, they didn't know scripture. They didn't preach sermons. And so Luther's desire to put it in the language of German, I mean, when you speak German, you spit most of the time. They were offended. They were horrified that you would translate it into the common language because people were too stupid to understand it. And Luther said, absolutely not. Uh, all people... God gave his word for people to have. And that is a huge Lutheran emphasis that the word of God is to be placed into the hands of God's people. So, for example, um, I tell our congregation periodically, and I often tell our board of elders, uh, it is your responsibility to not simply listen and hear what I say and just accept it hook, line, and sinker. You, too, have in your hands the word of God. And it is critical that, like the Bereans in the book of Acts, that you too hear the word and then say, let me make sure that's right. That Let me check it out. I want to be sure that we're being faithful to the word of God. So um, he gets married. Mary's a former nun. That's a scandal for the Roman church. He's excommunicated. His protagonist or his opponent is Pope Leo X. And Leo is the one who wants to build uh, St. Peter's Cathedral and the Sistine Chapel. And it's a big, expensive bill. And he needs to raise money. So he issues indulgences. People buy them. They're sold all over the Holy Roman Empire. You get forgiveness for money. It would be like me saying, you know, when you have the Lord's Supper, you get the forgiveness of sin. So you can only have the Lord's Supper if you cough up 50 bucks. And then you can have the Lord's Supper, something like that. It's just, uh, or like the money changers in the temple that Jesus drove out. It's just really something. He was corrupt, he was immoral, and he was extravagant. He had a number of mistresses and illegitimate children. And he was a disaster for the church. Um, and then the other key players, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, very devout, very devout, and... Uh, he presides at the Augsburg Confession and at the Diet of Worms uh, for Luther. And then a really key player on page 97 is Johann von Staupitz. And he is a wonderful figure who is really Luther's spiritual father in the Augustinian order. He's his superior. And he's the one who sends Luther to Wittenberg to learn, to really, to learn how to teach and to think theologically, to study the scriptures, to be a pastor, um, that was really what Johann von Staupitz, his own heart was for, and he wanted Luther to become that. And then you have this great defender of Luther, Prince Frederick of Saxony, 
And he, but history tells us that, that Frederick never became Lutheran. He always, he never renounced his Catholic faith. His son, his son does. His son is a staunch, devout Lutheran, Protestant. Um, but Prince Frederick was Luther's defender. Essentially, he was saying, look, you may not like him, he may not be right, but he's my citizen. And you can't just take him off and burn him and kill him. Um, I have a duty to protect his life. And that, that didn't sit well. And then you have Philip Melanchthon. And Melanchthon is really sees Luther in large ways as a father figure. Uh, they are colleagues in the professor. Luther, Old Testament professor. Melanchthon, New Testament professor. It's Melanchthon who writes the commentaries on Romans and Galatians. He's brilliant. And he writes the Augsburg Confession. Um, because Luther could not be present. He would have been killed. He would have been arrested and killed uh, in 1530. And then there's a number of other names of people that you'll see in the movie. John Tetzel, who sells indulgences, a Dominican friar. Um, Cardinal Cajetan and Oleander. They're papal representatives. Um, George Spalatin was a colleague and friend of Luther in law school. And uh, he's the secretary to Prince Frederick. And then there's another professor with Luther in Wittenberg, Karlstadt, Andreas Karlstadt. And I'm going to mention him for a minute because Karlstadt, when Luther is gone and in hiding, Karlstadt sees the reforms that are happening that need to happen to do away with indulgences and, and all of the, the, you know, the obsessions with saints and the Pope. And, and he takes the Reformation while Luther is gone and takes it in a more radical turn. He thinks that Luther is not going far enough or fast enough. And the reason I mention this to you is Luther's, Lutherans are the first Protestants. And Luther went so far in his trying to reform the abuses of the church and then no farther. So, for instance, Lutheran pastors still wear... Um, clerical collars, clergy shirts, uh, the, you know, the black shirt with the white collar around your throat. By the way, the meaning of that, that little white thing on your throat, is that you're supposed to preach faithfully the pure word of God. That's what that's about. Or we wear vestments and robes, stoles. We use colors and symbols. We have an altar. We kneel for communion. We have stained glass, statuary sometimes, not often, but sometimes. Uh, we use organs, and we do very traditional things. We'll chant in our formal worship. And there's a whole series of things that we do that we still, we, we baptize infants because we believe Scripture teaches and supports that because of the grace of God. Our understanding of the Lord's Supper is very elevated, much like the Catholic Church, somewhat different. But that wasn't good enough for other Protestants. They kept going. It wasn't radical enough, so they threw out more things and changed more things. And Luther's theory on this was, if it's not opposed to the Word of God, and it's helpful and blesses many of the common people, then, why, then let's retain it. Don't throw it out. If stained glass helps people learn the stories, if, if, uh, if uh, honoring and respecting the Virgin Mary gives us a wonderful view of motherhood without worshiping her or considering her perfect or without sin herself, then let's retain that. Um, if vestments and robes help us in our worship and our reverence, then there's no reason to throw it out. So this pretty this gets us now into sets the stage with the people and the places and the circumstances uh, for the, the the Lutheran Reformation. So with all that in place, it's really kind of a there's a bunch of kindling all set. And different people throughout the eras had, tr had kind of lit the fire, but it was quickly snuffed out. This is a spiritual pandemic, or virus almost, if, if you call it that, that fans into flame and is not extinguished and results in a, in a transformation of Western civilization and leads, in fact, to the Roman Catholic Church even experiencing its own Reformation. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is go ahead and watch that first part of the movie. You can watch it all. Do whatever you want. You can watch it three or four times if you want. If you're sitting home wondering what to do. It's a very well done movie. It's very faithful. It's very accurate. Um, and then we'll talk next week. So I want to talk to you about the, 
talk about a few things, but I have discussion questions in here as you watch the movie from part one. Part, and I actually, in this material, have it in four parts. So the first two parts are really part one, and then three and four is part two next week. And then we'll walk through that. And there's some timeline and dates and things, but then we'll talk about what came out of it. What was the big why of the Lutheran Reformation, and why does it persist today? So anyway, thanks for, your, uh, for tuning in and for your patience. And uh, I'll say the blessing, and I'll, I'll wish you a good night, and I look forward to seeing you again. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Have a good night. We'll see you, see you again soon.